has made. And we are to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I hope you were glad too. Let's continue praising his name.
this opportunity to come into your sanctuary yes, in public, be able to just oh, adore Lord, you and love you through the singing. You, Let Lord. everything that thank is said and done be done in such a way that it goes up to, uh, to your throne as a sweet fragrance. Yes, yes, Lord. Lord. Yes. And we know that when you are blessed, you bring down the glory from up above yes. and you bless us. So let us forget about our, ourselves and just concentrate on you. Yes, Lord. Be able to just raise the roof with praises yes. to you. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. We thank you for Jesus that you sent to die for our sins. And we thank you because he is worthy. He is worthy. He is holy. He is holy, he is holy. in the sanctuary. Bless you.
Lord, how we need you this morning, Father. Thank you, Lord. Touch us, Lord. Yes, thank you. Have your way, Jesus. Yes.
morning, church. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him in his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We, the women of Mount Hope, welcome you in the sanctuary today. We give thanks to God for this, the second annual Women's Day service. We give special thanks to Pastor Bala for his love, support, and guidance of the Women of Hope ministry. Each year, we choose a theme color for the Women's Day service, and last year we chose white, and if you look around, you'll see that this year we chose red. And ladies, you look absolutely gorgeous in your red. The Women of Hope Ministry is a ministry that includes all women of the church, regardless of membership. Our mission is to help women feel loved and accepted at Mount Hope Community Baptist Church. If you're visiting today, we want you to feel welcomed and loved. That being said, if you are here for the very first time, if you would please stand and an usher will bring you a microphone, please tell us your name and where you're from. Don't be shy. Please join me in prayer. Father, once again, we thank you for your grace, mercy, and provisions. Above all, we are forever grateful for the great gift of your Son, our Savior, who, though he was great, humbled himself so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. At this time, Lord, we wish to return a portion of all that you have graciously given us to, have, to honor your kingdom. Bless this offering and multiply it for your honor and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we have a message from a beautiful, talented, strong, courageous young woman of God who happens to be a member of our church, and she will speak to us about the challenges a Christian woman faces in college. Alexia Williams. Good morning, everyone. I am so happy to be back here this morning. I've been counting down the days. I'm finally done with exams for the week, so I'm so happy to be back. So I went to a couple friends of mine, and I asked them to define a Christian. And this is stereotypically things that they've heard, things that they may have believed at one point, and things that I've been told. A Christian believes in God. I think that's pretty accurate. Christians are boring. Christians are uptight. And Christians are hypocrites. So then I asked them to define a college student. And to that they said, well, college students are party animals. They are rebellious. They're studious, which I would hope. And this is what I found very interesting. They're lost adults. So, I took their feedback and I asked myself, well, what do I think of Alexia? And then I said, what do you guys think of me? Because I'm a college student and I'm a Christian. And they were like, oh, Alexia, you're, you're not like that. You're really nice and, and you know, you're, really, you're not judgmental. You're very loving. And I was like, okay. So, then why did you say all those other things? And they're like, well, <laughs> it's like, okay, guys. So then I took it upon myself to write down things that I believe I embody as a Christian college student. So I began with, I'm a believer in the word. I am a lover of Christ. I also love my family, my friends, and those who feel unloved. And I say that because Last year, um, I'm a sophomore now, I had many people come up to me and say, oh, Alexia, I, I've been told that you're easy to talk to. Alexia, I heard that you're really close to God so you can pray for me because God will probably hear your prayer. This year, I had the same thing happen and I've only been at school for a month and I had people coming up to me, oh, Alexia, I heard that you gave so-and-so good advice. Oh, I heard so-and-so has been reading this really pretty scripture. Where'd they find that? 
and I called a couple friends of mine, and I was like, is this normal? Is this something that happens? Is, is God, like, placing a little light over me to say, oh, you know, these people need help? I was very confused by it, but now I'm at peace by it because I know it's not just me. It's God working through me. So I also am a child of God. So the law deems me an adult, but I am by no means an adult. I'm very dependent on my parents, but more so I'm dependent on God. I wake up and I know that it, if it weren't for God, I wouldn't be breathing. I go throughout the day, you know, I might have a bad grade that I received or not so good score on my exam, but I know that my life will go on because God wants it to. Um, I am rebellious, and I say that because as any sinner, we are all sinners and we make mistakes. And my friends and lots of people often have the misconception that Christians are perfect and that if they mess up, then it's okay for other people to mess up. And I quickly tell my peers that it's okay to mess up, but you need to acknowledge that and you need to ask for forgiveness and you need to learn from those mistakes. But it's funny because the first thing that happens is, oh, Alexia messed up, ha, 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 that means that I can mess up too because she's a goody two-shoes. No, 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 no. I mess up, but I also am learning from that mistake, and I'm not ignoring the fact that, I can, that I'm a sinner. And that's the one thing that doesn't click with many people my age and many people that forget that God is the center of our life. You mess up and you move on and you ask for forgiveness and you remember that God loves us no matter what. So to the rebellious uh, statement that my friend said, they're like, Alexia, you've been to a party. That's not Christian-like. Like, okay. But can you say that um, going to that party, that when I came home that I didn't feel something, that I didn't go to bed and pray before I go to bed? I'm like, can you say that I didn't do that? And they're like, oh, well, fine. I find it funny that in school I'm targeted because I don't see myself targeting others. And it's hard. It's, it's certainly not easy. And I stand up to my friends by just trying, and not just to my friends, I stand up to others who also don't know me by just trying to maintain a humble spirit but by also using the word. So I wrote here in my little notes, I rebel with the word. I show others through my mistakes that only through God can you be forgiven, but also God is the only person you need to please because aside from being happy with yourself, we have to make sure we're right with God. And the only person that you can trust fully with your mind, heart, body, and soul is God. And I've learned that, um, that lesson over and over and over again. So when my friends come to me and say, oh, I heard you uh, had a nice scripture that you gave to so-and-so, um, I show them my many sticky notes. And I say, what do you, what do you need? I, I think I can help you. Um, <laughs> and... I got a little emotional when Miss Maureen emailed me and told me what the sermon was going to be based off of because if you can see, uh, Philippians chapter 4 is my, one of my favorite verses. It's highlighted in pink. And I often bring my friends to that scripture. And what resonates with them the most is the part of Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 4, that reads, be full of joy in the Lord always. I will say again, be full of joy. Let everyone see that you are gentle and kind. The Lord is coming soon. Do not worry about anything, but pray and ask God for everything you need, always giving him thanks. And when I share that, my friends are like, oh, so that's what you do? That's why, that's why you are the way you are? And I'm like, yeah, and you can be that way too. And it's not like it's hard to believe in God. And that I often 
battle with that as well. People saying, it's, I, I, don't, I don't get God, I don't believe, you know, I don't believe in the Bible, I don't go to church, so I can't ever be a Christian. And to those comments, I point them right here, or right here, or right here. <laughs> um, so I leave you all, and especially the young people here, um, don't be afraid to stand up for how you were raised and what you believe in, because ultimately you will be blessed. And you might not see it now, but you'll see it eventually. And I know that I went through a lot my freshman year, and coming back into my sophomore year, I feel like I've just grown astronomically, because now I am so much more confident in God's work with me and in me and through me. And that I know I can wake up and say, God's got my back. I'm good. And um, it's a great feeling. And if you don't feel it right now, you will feel it. But you just have to be strong enough. And it's not easy. And I think I'm going to emphasize again, I mess up. I make mistakes. I'm not claiming to be perfect. But I acknowledge that. And you have to acknowledge your flaws and move forward. And always trust in God and love God through everything and anything. Because I've learned time and time after again, God's got my back. God's got your back. And I leave you with that. Thank you. say thanks for the things you have done for me things so undeserved yet you gave to prove your love for me the voices of a million angels
church. Our guest speaker for Women's Day 2014 is Reverend Eleanor Lacey, who was born in Providence, Rhode Island, a daughter of Eleanor and Ernest Lacey. She is the mother of one son, Tyrone, and the oldest of four boys and one girl. Reverend Lacey was educated in the Providence school system. She is currently enrolled at Bolden Seminary, Wilmington, Delaware, and was ordained a minister in 2008. Reverend Lacey was employed at Rhode Island Hospital in the Outpatient Services Department for 49 years, retiring in September 2013. Reverend Lacey is a member of Macedonia UAME Church, Providence, under the leadership of senior pastor Bernice Perry. She was baptized in 1958 and rebaptized in 2000. Reverend Lacey preaches every second Sunday and is also a deaconess and a quarterly conference assignee. On a personal note, I worked with Reverend Lacey at Rhode Island Hospital for 23 years, and we still remain friends. She has been my spiritual mentor and advisor, and I am truly blessed, and I can't say it enough, but I am truly blessed to have her in my life. Before I introduce Reverend Lacey, Sia Mora is gonna come up and pray. Good morning, church. Today's scripture will be found in Philippians 4, verses 6 through 9. Please stand if you are able. This is the inerrant, infallible, life-transforming, living word of God. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the guest preacher that will be preaching today, and bless her with wisdom that she may touch our hearts. And please, Lord, help us today and open our eyes, O oh Lord, that we may be that we may behold wonderful things from your word, because your word is wonderful, and the unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to all who seek you. So please open our eyes at this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. like to introduce Reverend Eleanor Lacey. Good morning, church. First of all, I'd like to give all glory and honor to God, who is the author and finisher of my faith. I thank him for the opportunity to be here at this great church. I thank your pastor, Reverend Bala, for allowing me to share the pulpit with him. And I thank you, 
the offices and members of this church for making me feel welcome. I feel right at home, and I feel very blessed to be in the house of the Lord that loves to praise our Savior, Jesus Christ. I bring you greetings from my home church, Macedonia UAME Church. We're a small church on the corner of Ash Mountain Plain Street, where my pastor, Reverend Bernice Perry, sends her greetings along with our offices and members. I was telling the people in the earlier service that when Jackie asked me if I wanted to, would I accept the uh, offer of bringing the message, I said yes. And then after I thought about it, I said, I'm leaving my comfort zone because I've never done this before. And you know, when you go out of your comfort zone, you get afraid. But I'm here, frightened, <laughs> but I'm doing it afraid with the help of the Holy Spirit. So I just thank him for this privilege and this opportunity. I thank my friend Jackie for having faith in me and for being a good friend to me over the past 30 years. I don't know, she says she doesn't know what she would do without me being in her life. And I can say the same thing because she has been my mentor. She's my former supervisor. So I always have had the admiral respect for her. Can we just bow our heads in a moment of prayer, please? Father God, I just come to you once again as humbly as I know how, just to lift up the name of Jesus, just to give you glory and honor and praise, and just to thank you, Father God, for allowing me to share the word with your people. Father God, I ask that you would decrease Eleanor. Decrease me, Father God, and I ask that you have the Holy Spirit breathe within me Strengthen me and encourage me so that the message that you gave me to give to your people will not go unnoticed. That they can open their spiritual ears and hear what thus saith the Lord. And that when they leave here, Father God, they would have been taught by you what you want them to know, what you want them to learn, and how you want them to live their life. Oh, Father, I just praise you and I thank you for all that you're doing in my life. I pray for this great church, Father God, and I thank you for, for the spirit that they have. I thank you as they have ushered the Holy Spirit in this sanctuary and you can feel the presence. We give you glory and honor and praise, Father God. I pray this not by might, not by power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, says the Lord. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. For you are, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just have a question for you. And the question is, how are you living your life? How are you living your life as Christians? I'm going to give you a little background on the author of Philippians. Some of you might already know this. Some of you may not. I don't take anything for granted when I talk to the people of God because we perish from lack of knowledge. So this just may be something that you already know, and if you don't, you're learning something today. We find that Paul, the apostle, his real name was Saul, and he was um, called Saul of Tanat, um, 
Tarsus. And he was not one of the original 12 disciples, but he later became an apostle of the gospel of Christ after he had a conversion on the road of Damascus and was blinded for three days. And they had uh, um, some, the Lord sent a minister to him to minister to him. And he began his journey as one of our great leaders. He wrote almost two thirds of the book of the uh, New Testament. This was a man who persecuted the Church of Christ. He persecuted God's people, murdered them, tortured them. Then he had an encounter, a meeting, one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. Jesus changed his whole life. I'm saying that because if you are not a believer, and you have been met Jesus as your personal savior. Wait until you do, because your whole life will be changed once you experience Jesus. He's not somebody who is just written in a book. He's someone who lived and still lives he lives within us as believers, as Christians. And once you have accepted Jesus as your personal savior, we don't have any excuse for not walking the correct Christian walk. You see, the word of God was given to us for our education, was given to us so that we could read it and be instructed by it. It trains us how to walk the Christian walk. We have no excuse, because some, one of my professors said, once you've been taught the word of God, if you didn't know it before, once you hear it, you are held accountable for that. So the sermon that you're hearing today you are being held accountable for. And it's about our walk, our Christian walk. Now, Paul was born a Hebrew, persecuted Jesus Christ and the believers, had his conversion, and you can find all of that in the book of Acts, chapter 9, that tells you who Paul is and what he went through. He wasn't only a person that had a conversion, but even after he found the Lord, he went through many, many, many trials and tribulations and was tested time and time and time again. We as believers think that once we receive Jesus as our personal savior, that everything's gonna be fine. I'm here to tell you that's not true because the more intimate you become with Jesus, the more you're tried, the more you test it. You test it time and time and time again. Paul was a zealous person in everything that he did. He was a missionary and an evangelist and an author. As we read and study the book of uh, Philippians, chapters 4, verses 4 and 9, we find a letter to the church of Philippi. 
And this letter was written by Paul to thank them for their financial gift. As he is instructing them, he is, as he is thanking them, he is also instructing and teaching them, the church, also us now, on how we are to live a joyful life. Also, we are to thank him for meeting all of our needs, as well as being grateful. His letter is an encouragement to them, and it is to us today. It says, always to be joy, to be full of joy in the Lord, and to rejoice. How can you be full of joy in the Lord if you're going through something? If you're going through a financial crisis, if you're going through a sickness, I don't know what your issue may be, but I've had many issues in my life where the only thing I could do was pray and give it to the Lord. See, Paul also tells us that we are to pray. We are to pray for everything that we have, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. But when we pray, we don't really give it all to the Lord. We want to hold on to it and keep it. It says to pray without ceasing, to cry out to him, and to ask him to help us. But we don't. We think he needs our help. But he doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help. He's our creator. He created us so that we could be, be partners with him, to fellowship with him. All he wants of us is to fellowship with him. But we don't. We don't pray enough. We don't seek him enough. We don't thank him enough. We're too worried about what's going on in the world. We're worried about Ebola. We're worried about ISIS. We're worried about storms. We're worried about our health. We're worried how we're gonna pay our rent, how we're gonna pay our mortgages, how we're gonna have food on our table. The Lord provides all of that for us. All we have to do is trust him. When you trust him, then you don't have to worry. When you pray and ask him to take away all of these things to help you so that you are able to make your mortgage payment, you're able to get healed, he does that. And just because he doesn't do it the moment you say amen does not mean that he's not going to do it. Because sometimes it's a delay. He delays things for a reason. And sometimes we pray for things and it's out of his will. We ask him to pray, if it's your will, Lord, if it's your will, not my will, but your will. That's a key when we pray to God. Don't say, I want it. No, Lord, it's your will. Because you are the one who is the author and finisher of our faith and of our belief. You are the one who created me. You know all there is to know about me. You know all that there is that I need. And sometimes we ask for things that we don't even need. And we intervene and we call ourselves being intercessors and interceding for somebody else's behalf, on someone else's behalf, but it may not be the will of God, and we're praying against what he wants us to pray for. That leads us into forming a relationship with him, to abide in him. And sometimes you have to sit quietly by yourself, 
no praise and worship music on, no talking, just have your Bible on your lap. Sit quietly and hear him. You know, the first time you do it, you may fall asleep, but just keep persevering till you get it right. Because just as he spoke to the people back in the early days, he continues to speak to us now. And you'll recognize his voice. You'll know his voice. You will form an intimate relationship with him. He wants us to be intimate with him. He does not want us to be distant, and the only time we go to him is when we're in crisis. The only time we thank him is when something that we want, he fulfills. No, we're to thank him for all things at all times, every single day, a hundred, a thousand times a day. I mean, didn't he wake you up this morning? Didn't he put food on your table? Didn't he put clothes in your closet? Aren't you breathing air? Aren't you healthy? If you're not healthy, if you're a little under the weather, isn't he helping you to feel better? How in the world can we not thank a God who cares for us, who provides for us, and he's not asking us to do anything but to give him thanks, to reverence him, to form a relationship with him. He is God, our creator. He is Lord God Almighty. How dare we, how dare we not give him the reverence that he deserves? How dare we not thank him a thousand times a day and to pray with him a hundred or a thousand times a day for everything. Oh, Lord Jesus. Then we wonder why, as a young lady said, people think that we are hypocrites as Christians because they can't see the Christ in us. They see everything else but Christ in us. We represent the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the person who died on that cross for us to be free. And yet we walk the walk any way we think we can. We are not humble. We have no fruit of the Spirit in us at all. We're judgmental, we grumble, we criticize. We don't show a bit of being thankful. Then you wonder why people say, oh, so you're a Christian. It's our responsibility as children of God, as believers, as Christians, to help build up the kingdom of God. How can you build up the kingdom of God if you're not People can't see you as Jesus, his representative, his own personal chosen one. So you're not here by choice or by accident. You're here because you were chosen by the Most High God. You did not choose him. He chose you. And you have a responsibility to represent him in the right way. And the only way we can do that is with an intimacy with him, by praying and thanking him, giving him the glory and the honor, not being judgmental, to go over a, to forgiveness. I mean, he forgave us. He who was sin-free went and died on that cross for us so that we could have salvation, we could have freedom that we could praise him. You know, if you go to other foreign countries, you can't assemble like this, and you cannot worship and praise our Lord and Savior. We are blessed to be able to do that. We are blessed, but we don't do it. We don't do it because we, 
We don't have time. Make time. Make time. I challenge you this week to get out your Bible and read the 23rd Psalm. Do it five times a day. See how many times you get through it. That's a powerful prayer, the 23rd Psalm. And when you pray it in earnest, and then you ask the Father to help you in whatever situation you're going through, he answers that. But you have some work to do. You can't just sit back and think, oh, I want a million dollars, Lord. Just give it to me. He's not Santa Claus. He doesn't work like that. He supplies our needs according to what it is that we truly need. It's amazing to me that we, the people of God, don't witness enough, especially if we're in the workforce, to our coworkers who are just hanging out there on a thread. They don't know who Jesus is. How can you feel comfortable with that as Christians? Jesus is coming back for his church. It's our responsibility to go out and build up the kingdom of God. You can take a moment to invite somebody to come to your church, to ask them if they know Jesus. Do they want to know more about him? Some of us have been sitting in these pews for too long and we're comfortable. But sometimes you have to step out of your comfort zone. <laughs> like you told me. <laughs> I didn't want to do it. <laughs> but here I am because I am obedient to what he tells me, what he instructs me to do. He wants all of us to be able to witness to others to help build up his kingdom. You know, I don't want anyone that I know, or even someone that I don't know, to have to go to hell. Hell is permanent. It's torture. It's no fun place to be. When you think that you are a Christian and you're gonna go to heaven, that you're all safe and comfortable. What about the rest of the world, the rest of the people who don't know Jesus? It's our responsibility. We serve an awesome, awesome, awesome God who loves us so much and is so faithful to us. And I know personally that he's been so faithful to me in my walk, he's been more faithful to me than I could ever be to him. And there were times when I didn't pray like I should have. I didn't study my word like I should have. I didn't thank him the way that I should have. But I was taught. He brought challenges into my life that the only thing I could do was cry out to him stay on my knees and cry out and ask him to help me get through situations. When my son was in the hospital and almost died in the hospital for three months, and when you only have one child, that's a lot to have to go through every day but because of my faith, because I knew how to pray, because I prayed it out, I didn't look at the circumstances, I kept pressing forward. 
asking him to help heal my child, to help me to get through the circumstances. I still had to go to work each day. I still had to go to church each day. I still had to meet with people in my church and be uplifted. I couldn't be feeling sorry for myself. I couldn't then let, let them see me falling apart inside. It's only through the power of prayer and through the Holy Spirit ministering to me that got me through that. And it's only because you form a relationship with him that you can get through situations. And when he speaks to me, I get so overwhelmed because he calls me by my name. He will say to me, Eleanor, do this or don't do that. And he does it because he loves me for no other reason, because he wants me to enjoy my life. He wants me to have a life of joy. He wants me to be grateful for what I have. And we're to thank him for that each and every day. We don't take anything for granted. Because today's not promised to any of us. Tomorrow's not promised. We have to get it right. I'm just asking that in your time of trouble, you stay focused on Jesus. Don't stay focused on the circumstances, because that's what the enemy wants. He wants you to be down and out. He doesn't want you to have joy, peace of mind. That's why we have Jesus, and we can call on him any time, any day, night, any situation, whether in your home, in your car, walking. He's always there. Once we receive him, he lives right in us. He's right here. He's not going anywhere. We dismiss him. He does not dismiss us. In your time of trouble, focused on the king. Be grateful in everything that you do. Focus on reading the Bible more. Turn off the TV, those talk shows and all that other garbage that's out there. Read the word a little more. Start off maybe 15 minutes, even five minutes, and just let it con gradually grow. Focus on your praying. Pray five minutes, pray 10 minutes. Before you know it, it's an hour. Before you know it, it's three hours. You won't miss anything because you're developing a relationship with the Father. See, when I think about my God, I see him, a young man, 33 years old, who was perfect in every way. They beat him, tortured him, called him everything but a child of God, took and hung him on a cross, put nails in his hands, for what reason did he suffer and die for? For you and for me, so that we could have a Zoe life. And yet, you don't respect that. You don't thank him for that. I just Thank God, every day of my life, every moment of my life, for all that he has done for me.
but how he continues to bless me even when I don't deserve it. But he loves me that much. I can never love him as much as he loves me. Neither can you. He has a monopoly on that. But he is our God. He is our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords. He is our Savior. And all we need to do is continue to have faith and trust in him and let him take over your lives completely, completely. When the storms are terribly strong and there's darkness, there's havoc going all around, call on the name of Jesus. He's there right in the midst of everything. Just give him all glory, all honor, all praise, and thank him for everything that he does for us. Can we bow our heads for a moment of prayer?